you to today's webinar. If you are just signing in, please introduce yourself by entering your name, role, and organization into the introductions chat box. My name is Carmen Martinez, and I serve as the liaison for the New Mexico Achievement Gap Research Alliance at the Rail Southwest. This alliance is a collaborative partnership of educators, policymakers, and researchers seeking to examine, understand, and reduce this achievement gap through research and analytic technical support. During today's webinar, we will share two new Rail Southwest studies that examined how New Mexico high school students are faring under the state's new requirements for advanced course completion and graduation. These findings will be presented by Jill Walton and Eric Booth, who are principal investigators for each study. We also have two members of the New Mexico Achievement Gap Research Alliance with us. They are Patricia jimenez Lada and David Rogers, who will share their reflections on the applications and implications of the findings from these studies. In addition, Ginger Stoker will highlight an upcoming report that looks at grade nine students' perceptions of their non-cognitive skills in high school environments and how those perceptions relate to students' academic success in grade nine. Um, our presenters will be introducing themselves before each one of the presentations. Uh, first, we will hear from Jill and David. Then we will hear from Eric and Patricia, followed by Ginger's presentation. Before we continue, I would like to remind everyone to please introduce yourselves by entering your name, role, and organization into the introductions chat box. The three studies that will be discussed today were conducted in partnership with the Rail Southwest uh, and the New Mexico Achievement Gap Research Alliance. The Rail Southwest conducted work in collaboration and partnership with stakeholders. Um, as Jackie mentioned, Rail Southwest is in a partnership with education stakeholders in five steps in our state in our region. Um, we have Arkansas, Louisiana, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Texas. Uh, what we try to identify, uh, sorry, we try to address identified priorities and interests of these five states. And Rail Southwest supports eight collaborations uh, throughout the alliances. As I mentioned previously, today's goal is to share research findings from two reports that examine changes in New Mexico high school students' advanced course completion and graduation exam performance under the state's new graduation requirements. Um, in addition, we will be sharing information about a study that examines grade 9 students' perceptions of their non-cognitive skills in high school environments and how those perceptions relate to their academic success in, in grade nine. Finally, our overall goal is to connect practitioners whose work supports the reduction of the achievement gap among subpopulations of K-12 students with current research on issues affecting these students uh, in an effort to bridge research and practice. As a result of your participation in this event, we hope to increase your understanding of the changes in New Mexico high school students' advanced course completion and graduation exam performance under the state's new graduation requirements. Uh, we also want to inform you about a study examining the grade nine students' perceptions of their non-cognitive skills and the high school environment and how those perceptions relate to the students' academic success in grade nine. We also want to increase your awareness of the perspectives of practitioners regarding the application and implications of the findings of these studies on your work in New Mexico. Your feedback is important to us, so please make sure you have, take a few minutes to complete the stakeholder feedback survey after the event. 
uh, we will send out email reminders with a link to the survey so you can also complete it later. So thank you so much for joining us today. We hope that findings from these studies will help to inform your work. Now I will turn it over to Jill Walston, who will kick off today's presentation. Uh, Jill? Thanks, Carmen. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jill Walston. I'm a principal researcher with the RHEL Southwest. Um, and I'm going to uh, give you an overview of the, the findings from this report that um, Carmen just mentioned. Um, this is the uh, report, Graduation Exam Participation and Performance and Graduation Rates, an advanced course taking um, following changes in New Mexico's graduation requirements. Uh, so as Carmen mentioned, the, the work that we uh, do in this research uh, alliance comes from sort of the interests of the members of the alliance. And um, they're interested in looking at achievement gaps related to graduation rates, um, particularly during a time over the, the last few years when there have been some changes to the graduation requirements. So to start, I just have a uh, slide here that shows uh, the graduation, four-year graduation rates um, in New Mexico over, over these last few years. And the newest 2016 rate, there was um, an uptick a little bit. And I think the overall graduation rate um, was 71%. Okay. So in 2009, um, those of you on the phone, I, I noticed there are, are many from New Mexico probably are, are aware of these changes. There was a, a new graduation assessment um, was introduced. It went from um, the older exam, the New Mexico High School competency exam, to the standard-based assessment um, high school graduation exam. And of course, since then, um, more recently, the park is being used as a graduation exam. So the results that we're going to um, talk about today sort of go up until before that transition to the park. Um, so the, the change in the exam, students who were in grade 9 in the 08-09 academic year, we're going to refer to them as the 2012 cohort. That's the year they would graduate. Uh, where they could graduate on time. I mean, these exams are given, the older exam and the newer exam are given in grade 10, again in grade 11, uh, regardless of performance on grade 10, and then retakes were allowed in grade 12. There's also, uh, um, for students who don't pass the exam, uh, they can still graduate by demonstrating an alternative, an alternative demonstration of competency um, can be used, and that was true across the cohorts. And those kinds of things in, uh, include end-of-year exams or the PSAT. Um, in addition to changing to a new graduation exam, there were also changes made in the re in math and science course requirements. Um, in for the um, for the older cohort, three math courses were required, uh, including Algebra 1, and then when the new cohort, four courses were, uh, four math courses were required, including Al Algebra 2. So that was a, a pretty big increase in the rigor required to graduate. Uh, in science courses, the number of courses didn't change, but the number of lab courses went from uh, one to two. So three science courses, including two lab sciences, which are typically more rigorous courses, such as biology or, or chemistry, were required for the, for the later cohort. So this, uh, in summary, we can see that the, um, the new exam was started for, for the uh, 2012 cohort, although for this first year, uh, that, that cohort that took the new exam, it wasn't um, a graduation requirement that first year. And then starting with 2000, um, the 2013 cohort, um, that's kind of when the, the new uh, requirements were fully in place with the new exam and the change to the uh, more rigorous math and science uh, courses. 
So uh, before we started this study, we sort of we did some literature review to find out what uh, the literature says might be expected during this kind of um, increase in, in rigor for graduation re exam um, and coursework. And we found generally overall, there, uh, when looking across uh, at the population at large of students, there doesn't seem to be um, evidence that there's a big impact on graduation rate. Um, but um, when considering all students, but however, for uh, some minority students and some lower performing students, there can be a, um, a, a lower a graduation rate, higher dropout rate for those students. Um, some mixed results with when uh, coursework requirements go up in math and science. Uh, in some cases, there is found to be a greater dropout rate uh, for, for students, particularly Hispanic students in this one study. Um, and in the report, there's a whole appendix that summarizes this literature, um, if you're interested. So the research questions we tackled in this study, we were looking at the percentage of students who, um, who took an ex a graduation exam, uh, those who, who were in grade 11 and above. Um, of those who took the exam, the percentage that passed uh, reading, math, and science components, and then among those, um, depending on their performance in grade 11, what were the graduation outcomes um, for those students. And then in coursework, we were looking at the percentage of students who were taking Algebra 2 II and 2 lab science courses, um, and also graduation outcomes related to those, uh, to enrollment in those courses. Uh, we included, uh, for the exam performance, uh, Findings, we included all the students in five cohorts from 2011 to 2015 who were enrolled in at least a third year of high school. For the results related to uh, course enrollment, we included, we only had uh, full data for two cohorts, 2014 and 15, um, and, and we uh, included students who were in uh, the fourth year of high school. So, what we found, um, the percentage of students who, uh, who took exam uh, dipped a little bit for the 2013 cohort and then increased, um, increased somewhat uh, over, the, over the course of the year, uh, the course of these um, last three cohorts and kind of leveled out. So we see that um, white students are taking the exam at a higher rate. Um, than Hispanic and Native American students. And we know that the students who are not taking the exam uh, in grade 11, many of them are not um, there in school for the, for the fourth year. So it may be that those that didn't take the exam actually left school um, before the exams were given in the spring of grade 11. Found that the, um, the the rates of proficiency in reading were, were higher than it was for math and science, but more variable. Um, the, percent, the, um, the percentage of students who took, um, who took an exam in grade 11 or 12 and scored proficient or better on math increased from about 37.5% in the 2011 to 46% on 2014. So the math and science um, both actually had some, some improvement so moving from the old exam to the new exam. We looked at the percentage of students who scored proficient on uh, reading and math and science exams. That, the, that increased over time. Um, and it was highest, again, for, for white students. Um, and Native American students had, had a lower percent of students um, who passed all three uh, sections. So we looked at the students who, their performance in grade 11 on the graduation exam, and then their subsequent graduation outcomes. And as would be expected, the more 
sections that they passed in grade 11, the more likely they were to graduate on time um, in, their, in their fourth year. But when, and those that, you know, were proficient, all, all three sections had very high rates of graduation, somewhat lower for those um, with reduced numbers of sections passed. And if you look, kind of most interestingly, those who scored proficient on no sections, so they did take the exam, but they did not score proficient on any of the sections. Um, that rate of, the, of that group graduating, graduating on time has decreased over the prior few years. So for instance, those in the 2013 cohort, about 43% of students who weren't proficient in, in grade 11 on, on any of the sections went on to graduate, and that dropped to about 36% um, in the 2015 cohort. So, and there are, I, I just want to note that there are a, a lot more details about those findings in the report itself. Um, but I'll move on to some of the findings related to uh, course enrollment. So we see that, and again, we just have those for the two, the two recent cohorts. And we see that you know, enrollment in these more rigorous courses are on the rise, as you would expect. Went from, um, for those who have taken Algebra 2 II and 2 Lab Sciences, increased from 63% to 66% just in, in that one year. Um, and we see that most commonly students are taking, you know, many students, uh, up to 90% of the students are taking 2 Lab Science courses, um, and over 70% uh, in the 2015 cohort are taking Algebra 2. So we do know that New Mexico has a parent waiver for Algebra 2, although we didn't have data so we did on that, so we're not, um, uh, we're not sure, but we're assuming that those that didn't take Algebra 2 and went on to graduate had a parent waiver for, for that requirement. So looking just at students who had, who had enrolled in all three of those sort of new, newly required courses, Algebra 2 II and 2 Lab Science courses. So this, uh, this figure here shows among students who attended four years of high school, so this is the denominator here are students who are, who are in their fourth year of high school, the percentage who have enrolled in those three classes, and that has increased um, over the, uh, between the 2014 and 2015 cohorts. And, um, and actually the Native American students uh, are taking these courses at a, a little bit higher rate than the others. So we also see that taking these courses is associated, as you might expect, with uh, more likelihood of graduating on time. Overall, among students who are um, in their fourth year of high school, um, so this first overall bar here is 78 and 79% uh, go on to graduate. Uh, among those who have taken Algebra 2 and 2 Lab Science courses, that rate's higher, from 82 to 84% um, between those two cohorts. Those who have not taken Algebra 2 and don't have 2 Lab Science courses, uh, this, this um, on the right here, that was 33% for the 2014 cohort and actually increased a little bit to 41% in the 2015 cohort. We also see that among uh, students who are in their uh, four years of high school who enrolled in these three more rigorous courses, Algebra 2 II and 2 Lab Science courses um, by grade 12, that the, the graduation rates were higher for female students compared to male students, and this held true across um, all race ethnicity groups. And the gains between even just those two years was, was most pronounced for the uh, Native American males and females and uh, Hispanic males.
So I only have a minute left here. Um, so we did not, so some of the limitations of the studies, we didn't have um, grade 10 graduation exam data, so we weren't able to sort of look at graduation outcomes related to earlier performance in the graduation exam, uh, which would be another, um, another nice addition to this kind of work. Um, we don't have information on the alternative demonstration of competency, but that would certainly be an interesting extension of this work to look at the, uh, the use of, of that um, alternative to the graduation exam. And also, it's just important to note that during, the, during these um, past few years, there were other changes going on in New Mexico. Um, so you know, changes in graduation requirements weren't the only change going on. Um, just in summary, we, we know that a, a lot of the students are not, are not taking the exam, but we think uh, uh, that is because many of the students in the third year of, of high school are, um, those who aren't making it to the end of the year are, are not included here. We see that exam performance is in, improving somewhat for Hispanic and for black students, um, less so for the American Indian students. Um, there's, you know, still some challenges there with some of the um, subgroups. We know that exam performance is linked to, to graduation uh, outcomes. And we know, in, in related to course enrollment, we know that the use of Algebra II and, and lab sciences are on the, on the rise. Kind of nice news that among those students who, who stay in school for four years, the Native American students are enrolling in these courses at, at a relatively high rate. Um, and we know, uh, you know, male students are, are who have taken these um, advanced courses are graduating at lower rates than their than their um, female peers. Then I, I also have some uh, references here from the uh, from the literature review that if you're interested in those. And that's the end of my time. And uh, we're really lucky that, that we have David Rogers here uh, to, to uh, uh, have a presentation next. So I'll pass it off to David. Thank you very much, Jill. Um, and thank you to Southwest Rail for inviting me to be a part of this presentation this morning. My responsibility is to uh, reflect upon what we're finding in this research report, and then sort of just giving you some thoughts as to how this report could be useful to us in the, in the field here in New Mexico. Um, also, maybe to, to talk a little bit about its potential impact for us in our work statewide. Um, my, just a little bit about myself is I am uh, a member of the leadership team at Dual Language Education of New Mexico. We're an educational nonprofit that's committed to developing supporting and advocating for high quality dual language education here in New Mexico. And we also do a lot of work with districts outside of the state. Um, our strategic plan focuses on advocacy for programs, um, building instructional capacity as well as leadership capacity um, for school communities who have chosen to implement a dual language ed program uh, to develop an evaluation framework for um, for our programs at the site le at the school site level as well as in our LEAs and then to support research. Um, but out of our strategic plan, the second bullet there about building instructional capacity is really where we spend a lot of time working with schools, um, trying to ensure that they're continuously improving, which would um, include trying to make sure that what they're offering at the high school level and their in their course of studies, more and more rigorous content so that uh, in the bilingual programs or the dual language programs we support, it's not just about developing the English language, but it's actually being able to successfully complete a course of studies in two or more languages at a very high, um, at a very high level. Um, we were established in 2001, and many of people know us uh, as the hosts of the annual Acosecha Conference, which just finished last week. We had over 2,600 people. We're a proud affiliate of the New Mexico Association for Bilingual Education, and our two main partners in the state are the Center for the Education Study of Diverse Populations at New Mexico Highlands and the Kellogg Foundation. Um, when I think about 
the report, you know, I think in general, it just brings a better understanding um, to us all as, uh, as educators as well as service providers in, our, in my current role uh, of how our students are doing in, the, in our high school programs, um, which I really feel is already been helpful to many of our school communities. Um, information, any data that we can have on our own students, our own New Mexico born and bred students, and how well they're doing in the programs that we have here in our great state is much better than making decisions based on research that comes from other parts of the country or world. And that has been the case in, in, in much of the time in our past. So we're really glad to have this, this and other research um, reports that have come out through the MAG, the MAG um, initiative. Um, we're making better decisions now that we have this data on the quality of our course of studies that are being provided. Uh, of course, we're laser focused on trying to raise graduation rates, ensure academic and linguistic success for our students, and supporting them in deciding on a career or college pathway. And the information in this research helps us in understanding and making decisions in that area. It also helps us, uh, this research, with other policy changes that, are, that may be on the horizon. Um, as this report is inconclusive or doesn't have the only guidance to provide for us, but it really does lead us to other questions about um, course of studies, its rigor, and whether or not we're preparing students for graduation and career or college. Um, other issues and overall program components that support the student success comes into question. Um, for us, working in dual language education, we have um, we have the additional task of deciding with students and their families which content or core courses they're taking in um, not just English but also in Spanish. And so when we're adding Algebra 2 and a couple and an additional lab in the science areas, um, it's really exciting to see the schools we're working with um, also deciding, well, is that going to be provided in Spanish or even maybe in an AP setting, which many of our dual language high schools um, now have. Um, as a service provider in these schools, it's giving us, the, the report is giving us a lot of guidance on how to continue to improve the high quality K-12 dual language education pathway that we're working in many districts uh, to establish. The seal of bilingualism and biliteracy in our state is, of course, the brass ring that we're hoping our emerging bilinguals or second language learners are shooting for. So that upon graduation, um, they not only have uh, completed the core courses that are that are required by the state and our public ed department, but also have done so um, in two with the representation of courses taken in both Spanish and English, or Navajo and English, or maybe even one of the Pueblo languages and English. And in reference to alternative assessments, there are some school uh, are some students that are in the dual language programs that either enter late or just have been a struggling student in the program. One of the alternative assessments that's now um, available is the portfolio assessment that goes with that goes with students or, or students who are in our bilingual SEAL program uh, need to uh, complete in order to to graduate. And anything that uh, heightens or increases the rigor in the program like this, the additional um, Algebra 2 and Science Lab really um, can um, comes into play when we decide how that is going to be um, expressed in this portfolio assessment. The impact of the overall research, I think this is what has excited me most about being a part of this research alliance, is that for many of our states, and I do believe that includes New Mexico as well as most school districts that we work with. We find ourselves data rich and understanding core, meaning we seem to have a, a mountain of data available to us, but we often don't disaggregate and analyze that data in any useful format. Um, the experience we've had with uh, New Mexico uh, Achievement Gap uh, Research Alliance here is we've gone through or we've been able to participate in what I would consider an inclusive process where we identify the issues that were most relevant to our school communities and to our students. Um, we then worked closely to identify what research initiatives that we believe would help us uh, understand better and, and improve our educational programs. 
and then we were able to demonstrate how the data through this report should be disaggregated and analyzed for decision-making purposes. We think that it has done a lot to establish a baseline for many of our leaders, uh, policymakers, uh, leaders at our LEA levels, as well as our state levels and the PED, show them how we should be disaggregating the data in order to analyze it and make decisions. And now we have a baseline that hopefully will be added to um, as, as we get more, uh, more and more information about how many students are taking the exams, being able to pass which sections, and so on. So I'm very, very um, appreciative to have had the opportunity to be a part of this uh, alliance. And that concludes my, my uh, contribution. I'm going to uh, now pass this off to uh, Dr. Eric Booth. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, this is Eric Booth. I'm a uh, senior research scientist with Gibson Consulting in Austin, Texas, and a researcher here with the REL Southwest. Uh, today I'm going to talk about our paper that looks at advanced course completion rates among New Mexico high school students following some changes in the graduation requirements. This is a cover of our report. There you can see if you've downloaded it. And so just to give you a little bit of background on how this uh, research paper came about, uh, again, we were working with the New Mexico Achievement uh, Gap Research Alliance, and they were focusing on prioritization of research on college and career readiness and thinking about students' um, experiences and opportunities when it came to um, college and career readiness, specifically with advanced course taking. And they were interested in learning more about how advanced course taking uh, patterns were occurring across the state and across different groups of students. And so the paper that we're about to present um, was focused on that part of it, where we look at um, getting some, some initial sort of data about what those patterns of, of advanced course taking look like across New Mexico. because. As David just mentioned, um, a lot of decision making that's going on is based on uh, data and reports and published findings from other states because these patterns had not yet been reported in a way that they could look at. Um, and so the context for our study there is very similar to what uh, Jill Walton already presented, which is that we were sort of looking at these rates uh, under the um, auspice of this policy change that happened in Mexico. While she focused on some of the changes in course taking requirements for some of the higher level advanced courses like um, Algebra 2 and things like that, in our paper we focused on um, the advanced course requirement which is that students are required to take uh, courses like AP or IB or Honors or Gifted or Talented courses. So um, we looked at the, I just mentioned about the AP, IB, Honors, and Gifted and Talented courses. And we were looking at um, these rates across student subgroup primarily. The Alliance pointed out that 69% you know, of the state's population in Mexico are Hispanic or American Indian. And that, is, that looks different than a lot of other states in the U.S. And so they were interested whether some of the findings that, that are presented um, in the empirical literature, and also we summarized those in the appendix of our paper, whether those hold true for New Mexico. And so we gathered data that looked at the population of three cohorts of students who began school after that state policy change that Jill Walston mentioned. And um, so our cohorts are the freshman year, students that started their freshman year of high school or ninth grade in 2009-10, 2010-11, and 2011-12. And our research questions uh, for this paper are what percentage of the students who entered uh, New Mexico high school in grade nine were enrolled for four years, completed at least one advanced course. So we're here, we're just trying to get at what percent of students met that um, legislatively prescribed uh, advanced course requirement. And we look at it in sort of this tripartite way where we say what percentage of students had zero advanced courses. In other words, um, of those students enrolled for four years, uh, which percent never met that, that requirement versus the percentage who completed one, which would meet the requirement, or two or more. And we kind of break it out that way in the graph uh, that you'll see in a moment. 
The second research question is basically extending on that and looking at course completion rates across various students, uh, student characteristics and subgroups, uh, including race ethnicity, based on their prior uh, performance, so like looking at higher performing students versus lower performing students, and um, eligibility for federal school lunch programs, so uh, sort of a, a proxy for SES, um, and uh, English learner status. We also looked at these rates broken out by school characteristics, including the school performance ratings, uh, school size, Title I status, urbanicity, things like that. So a couple of quick comments about the data and methods we used. Um, we were able to obtain individual level student records from the STARS data system from New Mexico Public Education Department, which was uh, very helpful. And then we linked that up to the National Center for Education Statistics Common Core data to get information on uh, school characteristics of interest, like urbanicity and Title I status. And we had records spanning from 2008-9 through the 2014-15. Uh, that's how we built our cohort uh, that started in 2009-10. That 2008-9 year was how we got our prior eighth grade performance data. So it's just used for sort of our, our uh, prior data, our lag data. And our methodology here is it's just a descriptive study. So we're just trying to build an evidence base here about how these rates are different for different subgroups and different types of schools across New Mexico. And so we use descriptive statistics in the sense that we just look at um, rates or percentages by different groups. Uh, we had 57,000 or so students that met the criteria of those three cohorts who started in ninth grade and went for four years, um, regardless of what their final outcome was in their fourth year. We didn't redact kids if they dropped out or graduated or, or something else. Um, and that ended up including high school students from about 124 districts and 238, both public and charter schools were included in the analysis. And that's discussed a bit more in the paper in Appendix B2, I think. And so you can see there the, the ways we break it out by student subgroup characteristics and school characteristics. I've already kind of described that. But these are the ways that you'll see the graphs presented throughout the presentation. So we'll get straight to the findings. Um, the first finding is that about 50, just over 56% of students uh, in our cohorts completed at least one advanced course. So in other words, they met that uh, legislatively prescribed um, policy change about completing at least one advanced course during our time frame. So 44% of the students in our sample, or our subgroup, um, completed zero advanced courses. 18% just met the standard completing one advanced course. I say standard, I should say, I should say graduation requirement. And then 39% exceeded that graduation requirement by completing two or more advanced courses during their, their high school tenure. Of the 44% that completed zero or more, we don't really go into breaking that out in the paper. And a lot of that's for the reasons that Jill Walston already mentioned in her slide, that there are different reasons why students um, don't, who don't complete those advanced courses during our time frame. One is they continued on school longer and later completed advanced courses. They were in school five or six years. Uh, they dropped out. They um, got some sort of waiver or alternative, ADC, alternative, um, uh, I've, I've forgotten the, the acronym, but basically alternative competency um, waiver. And so we didn't have, we didn't really break out the reasons they didn't complete it. We were focused more on who completed them. If you've looked at the paper, uh, this is figure two straight out of the paper. Uh, and this first one just breaks out that prior pie chart by race ethnicity group. And so this is, there's a lot here, but just quickly sort of, if you fudge your eyes over and, and, and just focus on the, on the chart, the relative differences, I'm going to point out um, kind of the difference here with this green arrow of the students in the on the left of the the darker blue bar here that's the percent of student percentage of students who completed zero courses so you notice that is lower for the white students and it's higher for the hispanic students and american indian students so the distance between this sort of blue bar uh, for percent who completed zero advanced courses for white students is there's a large gap 
between the white students and the Hispanic students, and a smaller gap between the Hispanic students and the American Indian students. And I think you'll see the gap is kind of an important way to view these graphs in the sense that you'll see that gap relative between white students and Hispanic and American students collectively. You'll see that gap sort of move depending on the way we break this data out throughout the report or throughout the presentation. And so I just wanted you to kind of see that. But this graph overall, um, I'm sorry, this figure, is looking at course completion by race ethnicity group. And so you'll notice that we don't have um, students of other race ethnicities, including um, African American or black students. And the reason for that is basically combined together American Indian students, Hispanic, and white students made up about 97% of our sample. And partially for brevity and partially just for clarity of visualizations, we focused on these groups and making the comparison. Um, so here you can see that there's a, a pretty large gap between the percentage of uh, white students who completed one or more or two, or, I'm sorry, one, one advanced course or two or more versus the percent who completed um, one or more advanced courses who are Hispanic or American Indian. If you sort of look at the course completion by student performance, there's a, this, which is another way we look at it in the report in a couple of different ways, um, this is basically where we take students and we take their prior eighth grade performance um, and we look at the higher performing versus lower performing students, basically students who um, performed, who were proficient on their eighth grade standards based exam. And we look at the, the same sort of gap. And what we find is that the gaps in advanced course completion rates by those ethnic racial subgroups were smaller for the higher performing students. And then for the lower performing students, the gap was wider. And so the first bullet point sort of summarizes that, but the second point talks specifically about what that gap looks like. And then I'll show you the figure next. But basically the gap in the percentage for the higher performing students is about four or six four to six percent. Um, so it's four percent between whites and Hispanics and six percent between whites and American Indians essentially. But that's for the higher performing students. But when you look at the lower performing students, it's a wider gap. It's about 12 to 13 percentage points. And so here's what that looks like. This is from figure three in the report. And you can see the first grouping of bars at the top is the higher performing students. Um, and that gap is still there for the higher performing students. But it's smaller, um, especially in comparison when you break out the lower performing students, where the gap between white and, a, and the non-white students is larger, but also you can obviously see, and this would be expected, that um, a lower percentage of those lower performing students completed advanced coursework. A few other ways we broke this out, we looked at um, some other characteristics like whether the student was qualified for a free or reduced meal eligibility. Um, and you can see that those students who were eligible completed at least one advanced course at quite lower rates. Um, about 24 percentage points lower. And you get a similar sort of pattern with breaking it out by English learner status. EL students or English learner students completed at least one advanced course um, at a rate that was about 23 percentage points lower than non-EL students. So moving to sort of school level characteristics, we're trying to get at here um, a sort of second level of, well, how, how much does the, do these rates differ by different types of schools? And again, we don't do a sort of um, multivariate sort of framework where we're controlling for these things at different levels. It's more of just we're breaking out how um, the, these patterns differ for different types of characteristics. So here we're just isolating and looking at school characteristics. And so from figure six from the report, um, this is looking by school performance rating in New Mexico, which um, I think is pretty, it's one of these things where in a lot of states, school performance rating is, is kind of a contentious thing. But regardless of how the sort of data generating process occurs here about how these schools are categorized, you can see kind of the, it's a kind of a, a bimodal distribution here where schools, the highest rating schools, the A-rated schools, have the lowest percentage of kids who um, aren't compete, are not completing advanced courses. And then students who are in schools with an F rating have the highest percentage of students that aren't completing courses. And in the middle, the B, C, and D schools, it's about the same. Um, 
they're kind of in the middle of the pack. Now, if we take the two, the student characteristic and the school characteristics that I just talked about, and we look at schools with higher performance ratings and schools with lower performance ratings, and then we look at those highest performing students in those schools, we see an interest, a couple of interesting things, but a few that I'll highlight from the report. This is from figure seven in the report, but the highest performing students in those higher performing schools, they almost uniformly um, complete advanced courses at very high rates, and the gap between white students and non-white students is relatively smaller. For the, higher, for the highest performing students in the low rated schools, the gap is pretty large between white students and non-white students, but still a, a much higher than average um, amount of students complete advanced courses. So that can sort of show you that even in, in challenging schools that aren't necessarily doing that well, the highest performing students are completing at higher rates than, than, um, their, than the average, at least. If we look at the same graph, but looking at lower performing students, so all that's changed here in this figure is that we're now looking at lower performing students, and this is between the top group is for the highest rated schools and the lowest, and the second set of bars is for the lowest rated schools. Um, here is where you see a lot of the students who aren't completing advanced courses, but the lower performing students in those higher performing schools, and I think you could expect this, but this sort of visualizes exactly what we see, those students, um, even though they're lower performing, are, um, are completing advanced courses at higher rates. And for the lowest performing students at lower rated schools, they're performing, they're, they're completing advanced courses at the lowest rates. Um, and the gap between the, the race ethnicity groups is, is smaller. And in fact, it's actually a little reversed between Hispanic and American Indian students for that subgroup only. And I'm running low on time, so I'm going to kind of slide through the last couple of things. Um, the last sort of findings, we talk about sort of the, the, how school size and urbanicity matters. One thing to note for New Mexico, um, there's, there's a lot of small schools and also a lot of rural schools. And course completion for the smallest schools uh, was essentially you have 46 percent of students who completed advanced courses in those smallest schools. When we look at Title I um, schools, as you might expect, the Title I schools had higher rates of students not completing their advanced course requirement. And then when you look at it by urbanicity, um, using the Common Core data, the rural schools had the lowest rate of students who weren't completing advanced courses. But again, a high percentage of, the, of schools in New Mexico and in our study are rural. Luckily, we're going to have some more time to talk about implications. So now, since I'm out of time, I'm going to kind of pass the baton over. But the big picture, one of the big picture takeaways is that some of the largest gaps between higher performing student, white students and American Indian and Hispanic students at schools with the lowest performing ra performance rating and in schools with fewer than 750 students. Um, and so the Alliance has talked about you know, a lot of things around improving school resources and future research. And luckily, we have uh, Patricia Jimenez-Latham from New Mexico Highlands University. And she's going to talk a little bit more about these implications and uh, some further, further thoughts on this study in particular. And so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to her. And we'll have some time for questions a little later. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, my name is uh, Patricia Jimenez Latham, and I'm the director of the Center for the Education and Study of Diverse Populations. And like David, mi hermano, I'm very, very pleased with the reports that have come out through our partners at South, Rail Southwest and AIR. And um, we're just excited that we have this research here in New Mexico because many times we're, we're challenged with, well, where did you get that research from? And uh, well, we need New Mexico research, so now we have it. So thank you so much to our partners. Again, I'm the director of the Center for the Education and Study of Diverse Populations at New Mexico Highlands University. And uh, what we do is provide professional development and technical assistance uh, to uh, schools, administrators, teachers, families throughout the state with a focus on language, literacy, multicultural education, and building family partnerships. We also collaborate with like-minded organizations to advocate and support for our culturally and linguistically diverse students across the state. Uh, 
as a, a great partner with uh, my colleague David Rogers. So what I have done is pulled a couple of key findings with some reflections and uh, some possible implications. So one of the ones I found very interesting was that for students who entered a New Mexico high school in grade 9 in 2009-11 and remained enrolled in four years, the percentage who completed at least one advanced course was higher among white students than among American Indian and Hispanic students. Well, no surprise, we've known this, but now we have the New Mexico data to support it. And thinking about New Mexico itself, over 70% of our students come from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, 61% Latino and 10% Native American. So what are high schools doing to really focus on what they're doing to support students, and are they providing information related to advanced course offerings? And are schools providing support for students who are struggling or may not feel confident in pursuing these advanced coursework? So what are they doing? And the implications, as we know, the findings certainly mirror what we already know um, in the research throughout the nation. But might we look at taking a closer look at how and who they're marketing advanced coursework to? So is this information getting out to our, our uh, culturally and linguistically diverse students? And to pull together that data to look very critically through that lens and to find out who's taking that um, advanced coursework and is it equitable? The next one in considering this finding is approximately 49% of our students who were eligible for federal school lunch programs completed at least one advanced course compared to 73% of students who were not eligible. Again, this mirrors what we know nationally. So what comes to mind for me is really thinking about equity versus equality. And are we providing those opportunities for our, our students to, to take these courses. Of course, equality is we offer uh, advanced coursework, but equity is are we ensuring that all of our students have this opportunity? And we have the data, and we have it now, and so how do we disaggregate that data to ensure, ensure that lower socioeconomic students have the same access to advanced coursework? Implications? Of course, poverty continues to be an indicator of student academic success. We certainly know that. But what are we doing to ensure readiness and to provide support for students that may be lacking these skills or feel unsure of themselves? And maybe they do have the skills, but they, they don't feel that they're adequate enough to serve in these advanced courses. Perhaps we might want to survey students to see what kind of support they may need some non-cognitive factors come to mind and to find out what our students really need and how we can support them in, uh, in wanting to take some of these advanced courses. Another key finding, approximately 30% of English learner students completed at least one advanced course compared to 60% of non-English learners. So reflection and really thinking about this. Are teachers that work with EL students aware of strategies such as sheltered instruction? And are content area teachers also have accessible to them strategies in sheltered instruction, second language acquisition? This becomes really important because what we found in some of our schools is that the ESL teachers, um, they have all the tools and certainly they do share with their colleagues, but what are we doing to support all content area teachers to uh, support these EL students? We do have the tools with our um, access for ELL uh, test, the screener for English language proficiency, but what are we doing with that data? Is it just a series of numbers, or are we actually supporting 
uh, teachers with information related to how do you read that data and how are you using English language development standards to support what those numbers mean. Again, some things that we need to consider are that it's not only the ESL teachers' responsibility to disaggregate this data, but all teachers, and to really begin having school-wide conversations on how EL students are being serviced and take a critical look at how EL students are provided access to advanced coursework. So opening up the dialogue for all teachers in our high schools. This is my last finding, and I, I wanted to go ahead and project this slide because if you look at it, it really tells us a story. In New Mexico, we've had a school grading system since about school year 2011-12, and it is pr a pretty much a contentious topic. But if you just look at what the data suggests, it really helps us to begin a conversation about what we might possibly have to do next. So the key finding is the percentage of students who completed at least one advanced course was highest among students at schools with the highest performance rating. So thinking about the school grading system, what are schools with the highest performance ratings doing to ensure diverse students are participating successful, success, successfully excuse me, in advanced courses? And might high expectations and course rigor focus on college and career readiness to be a factor? Implications? Well, what a school might want to do is once again disaggregate that data into student demographic data and target which students are successfully completing these advanced coursework and to ensure equity and access for all students and investigate what higher performing schools across the state are doing. Is there a difference? Are schools that are achieving a grade rating of an A, are they doing better with their EL populations, their Native American populations, their uh, Latino populations, et cetera? So thinking about what we might do with the results of this study, some things come to mind. We need to share this information widely across education-focused organizations across the state. And my colleague David and Rogers and I will certainly do that. And we do have some uh, really great other organizations that focus on um, our diverse student populations. We need to provide outreach to districts and charter schools to make them aware of this current study. Because if, if we don't, this incredible opportunity just might not get disseminated the way we li would like it to. We have next step conversations with the New Mexico Public Education Department to discuss key findings of the study and implications for New Mexico high school students. So begin those conversations because now, again, with legislators and administrators, we have the data that um, tells the story of New Mexico. And um, something that's close to most, both David Rogers and I is we're both part of the Hispanic Education Advisory Council and um, looking at what some next steps might be for us as part of this council is uh, we would like to create an equity index survey and perhaps disseminate that to New Mexico high school students to find out more information as to what a great majority of our students need so they too can be very successful in whatever they pursue. So with that, um, Carmen, that concludes my presentation. Thank you so much, Patricia, and thank you to all your presenters and discussants for sharing your insights. Uh, we now have time for questions, so we invite uh, the audience to enter your questions on the chat pod below our pictures. Um, I will get started with a question that was posted earlier, and this question is, did the state, New Mexico, say whether they have data on ADC waivers. Um, Eric, uh, can you tell us something about this? Sure thing, Carmen. Um, the short answer is 
No, we did not have that data in the data we, that we received from um, PED uh, that contained any sort of flag about ADC, um, the Alternative Demonstration of Confidence, which is the acronym I could not remember a second ago. Um, and so I quickly looked. That does not mean they don't keep it centrally located or, or monitored or, or archived at PED. And I looked in the STARS manual and documentation they provided, and I did not see any field that indicated that that data was there. Um, now, again, this is data that they have for, for sort of using for reporting and sending out to researchers. They may keep it tracked internally. And so I'd be curious if anyone in the audience, um, I know there are a lot of people from New Mexico, um, whether they have any insights on this. But it's, um, it's certainly something we didn't have access to, unfortunately, but would love to have access to. Yeah, and if someone in the audience has this information, you're only able to type your answers into the question uh, and discussion pod, so you can do so uh, by entering your responses there. In the meantime, I will address, uh, we will address some of the recurring questions entered during the registration for this webinar. And I'll start by asking David to answer uh, the first question. David? How can we best support bilingual students? Thank you, Carmen. Um, well, just first to, 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 to be clear that a bilingual or an emerging bilingual student in a, in a bilingual education program at the high school level as, as is our focus today. Um, some of them were our English language learners. Some of them are former English language learners. And many of them are native English speakers who just have chosen to be in one of New Mexico's developmental bilingual education programs. Um, when we look at these two reports and we are working uh, to build successful bilingual programs for these students at the high school level, the, it, there's a, a lot of information here that helps us ensure that we're putting together a rigorous program, not just to ensure success in linguistic development in the area of English, but also to make sure that um, academic success is also um, uh, the focus of these programs. Our bilingual SEAL program, for example, in many of our high schools has very high rigor. It requires eight core courses in a high school course of study to be completed in a language other than English for many of our schools. And many of these uh, course offerings um, let's say are offered in Spanish, for example. Many of those are AP courses. Um, we are trying to, we are trying to um, battle uh, a historical myth that bilingual is something uh, of a remedial program for students who are underachieving. Um, with this report and what we're learning from the research, um, it's only going to help us to continue to build programs that are actually of high rigor uh, with the bilingual seal um, as, as a prize, if you will, for the graduating student who completes it, um, as many of the portfolio assessments that students need to complete in addition to other requirements for graduation for the bilingual seal um, includes AP courses and Algebra II and uh, higher level uh, science courses. So I would just say that, you know, how can we best support bilingual students? I think it's by beginning with building quality programs that's built on research like this that is not only um, focused on English language proficiency, but actually high academic achievement in two or more languages. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, I'm now going to ask a related question to Patricia. Uh, Patricia, how can we best support the academic achievement of English learners for college and career readiness, and most of all, for an equal education opportunity? That's a very, very important question, Carmen. And you know, thinking about our students, uh, the persons closest to our students are certainly their families, but uh, most important, the teachers that are with them every day of their academic journey. And so thinking about this, perhaps thinking about pre-service teachers and what colleges of higher education can do to ensure that that first year teacher, who many times are in the most challenging schools, 
um, are equipped with how to support our students uh, in college and career readiness. And that's one thing. But you know, through the lens of, of the things that we've just talked about for the past hour, and ensuring that teachers understand things like second language acquisition, who ELLs are, who uh, culturally and linguistically diverse students are, that first year is critical for the teacher and most critical for every student they serve. And possibly along with that is certainly to require that uh, both uh, the K-12 and, of course, higher education use some Title II professional development monies that are really geared toward, yes, college and career readiness and ensuring our teachers have all of those skills necessary, but through that lens of the culturally and linguistically diverse student. So that way they are able to prepare them for college and career readiness, all students, not only equity, but and not only the equality, but the equity as well. And finally, um, to certainly do whatever we have to do to support families to understand college and career readiness and what those implications are. Many of our parents are still very confused about what content standards are, let alone college and career readiness. One thing that I've found in some of the work we do with families is that if you can bring them in, they have so much to, to share to the conversation. And um, they've got wonderful questions. So really critically thinking about what we're doing in regard to outreach to some of those parents who need to come and have this critical conversation about their students and how we best prepare them for college and career readiness. Thank you, Carmen. Thank you, Patricia. And since you were just talking about uh, the importance of informing, um, you know, keeping families well informed and engaged, I would like to ask uh, both you and Eric to address the following question. Uh, first, you, Patricia. How can we best engage parents and communicate in a positive manner so that there are no surprises as the graduation time nears? Patricia, what are some of your thoughts? Again, excellent question. You know, certainly we look through the lens of all students, but uh, in, in thinking about culturally and linguistically diverse families, we, we need to help ensure that educators can build an understanding of family and community engagement. And what does that mean in relationship to cultural competency? And explore how people's cultural lens, beliefs, and assumptions can influence interaction. Possibly another thing is to, to build a, certainly that uh, cultural bridge. What strategies can we pull together to build relationships and to tap into the strengths of families and communicate in, in ways families understand, whether it be ensuring that we, we send out whatever we send in, in um, many multiple languages, if, if possible, but also ensuring that they are always included. Perhaps building trust relationships with families and community through effective communication. That two-way communication is critical. And you know, really thinking in regard to working with schools, having those critical conversations about our families, and are we really providing the outreach necessary to be inclusive of all families? And when you invite them in, certainly engaging them in the data conversation. Um, again, having been in schools who have done this effectively, the parents love to see that data, and they do understand it. So you know, it's really no different than serving any other student within our school, but really looking through that critical lens of culture and language is, is very necessary to be able to um, outreach to this particular group. Thank you for sharing your insights, Patricia. Eric, uh, would you like to add other uh, suggestions? Sure thing. I think um, Patricia's comments were spot on. So I'll focus sort of on the second part of the question about the graduation timing. So in thinking about the ways in which we can kind of monitor students 
to see if they're on track to graduate, if they're taking the right courses and credits. I think there's a lot of, um, I mean, this is not something that, that our paper explicitly was, was looking at, but I think it's another way to look at this information. There's a lot of great research out there on this. And I'll sort of talk about three quick ways to think about it. One is um, there's a lot of, of research on uh, early warning systems and how effective they are and the ways to implement them and the challenges for that. But that helps us monitor um, whether or not students are taking um, the right, the courses or failing, or I guess but more specifically are failing out of courses that they need to be passing or dropping out of them. But I think the issue about staying um, on the path to graduation is about sort of credit monitoring, which is a little bit broader. And here, a lot of the the best practices literature and things I would encourage you to look at the what, what's work, uh, what works clearinghouse on this because there's a lot of good information about how the timing matters a lot. And so I heard this this feedback from our great partners in New Mexico at, in the alliance that talk about how for some student subgroups um, who aren't as informed or maybe their parents aren't as informed or families aren't as informed about what's required, the timing can get them because they wait too late to take courses they need to graduate. Um, and so they end up either dropping out or staying in school longer. And then that can affect some subgroups differently. A great example was brought up was how EL students have to take language electives that sort of get in the way of, ta of a, reaching some of these, taking some of these required courses. Um, and so a challenge there is that sort of monitoring the credit accumulation or the path to graduation is difficult in the face of um, what sort of tracking what courses count for each student's um, graduation. As we saw in New Mexico and Jill Walson talked about, these have changed over the years. So you can imagine that having a central repository of all the courses, tracking which ones count, um, and then taking into account ADCs and things like that, that gets really tricky. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is that the, the literature, especially the work, What Works Clearinghouse, has some information on another way to think about this question, which is what what um, what things basically, what does the research say is predictive of students staying on that path to graduate? And here, um, there's a lot of things about advanced courses and how this varies by subgroup. But I think um, a lot of the literature talks about how early indicators are important. Those can be eighth grade performance, can be performance before eighth grade. A lot of it is the non-academic and cognitive factors that Patricia mentioned. And I think you'll hear a little bit more about in a second. Um, and there's other things that structure a student's probability of, of graduating in terms of their whether they're retained in ninth grade and their attendance rate and things like that. So um, I think there's a lot of great research out there on this. It's, it's one of those areas that's uh, rapidly advancing. And hopefully, we'll get an opportunity to do more of that kind of research next in New Mexico at some point. Thanks, Eric. Um, I, we, we have a couple of minutes left. So before I ask another question, I would like to give a chance to our audience to give us some uh, comments. So we would like to hear from everyone. And down in the questions and discussions chat pod, I would like you to list two or three major obstacles or barriers that you have observed that prevent or discourage students from participating in advanced coursework. Uh, and if you look to the right of the questions and discussions uh, discussion pod, you will see that we posted the question that I just asked. Uh, we would love to hear your um, comments about this. Because we know what the literature says, we know what some of the research says, but we also want to know what you have experienced but you have observed. Stephanie says lack of access to courses in rural schools. Certainly something that has also been documented in the literature. Um, Stephanie, would you like to share some thoughts about um, how these, uh, this obstacle could be addressed? Do you have some suggestions based on your experience? Like, what do we need to do to increase the access to courses in rural schools? And I see that Chris is writing something. 
Um, in the meantime, while you're writing your thoughts, we, we actually are running out of time, so I'll give you some more time. I see that Chris West uh, is saying that in Santa Fe, we have the opposite problem. Students who are enrolled in advanced coursework that perform poorly. And this uh, depresses their GPA. So here we have a situation where there, there's course availability, but the problem is that students are not uh, performing on those courses. And again, I would like to see if you have some suggestions on to how to address this problem. Um, we are now just in time, however, so you can continue to type on the chat pod. But I would like to now introduce uh, Ginger. And before I do that, um, you, uh, we would like to remind you that if you need to leave early, uh, please remember to complete the survey. But now we will hear from Ginger Stoker. So, Ginger. Um, Are you there, Ginger? Hi. Oh. I, I, yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yes, I'm here. Um, good afternoon. I'm Ginger Stoker. I'm a senior researcher um, at AIR. Um, working on projects for the Rail Southwest. Um, the title of my presentation is Understanding the Role of Non-Cognitive Skills in School Environments in Students' Transitions to High School. Um, since the final report for this study isn't yet available, uh, my presentation is going to focus on background for the study, uh, the data collection methods, the survey that was used to collect data on students' perceptions, as well as potential uses for um, the survey data. So um, similar to the other presenters, the study was conducted on behalf of the New Mexico Achievement Gap Research Alliance. Uh, members of the New Mexico Achievement Gap Alliance um, expressed interest in learning whether improving high school transitions for American Indian, his, American Indian and Hispanic students could close achievement gaps. Um, given the research linking grade 9 performance and high school graduation, Alliance members were particularly interested in issues concerning academic preparation for high school and the relationships between non-cognitive skills, high school environment, and student success in grade 9. Uh, so in response, we designed a study of grade 9 students' perceptions of their non-cognitive skills and high school environments and how those perceptions were related to academic success in grade 9. So the study used data from students in New Mexico to examine how their perceptions of their non-cognitive skills on school environments were related to three outcomes that have been identified in prior research as being associated with a successful transition to high school. Um, these outcomes are grade 9 grade point average, grade 9 course failures, and grade 9 absences. The study was guided by four research questions. Uh, the first research question is, how do grade 9 students' perceptions of their non-cognitive skills differ between American Indian and Hispanic students and white students in New Mexico on average? The second research question is, how do grade 9 students' perceptions of their school environments differ between American Indian and Hispanic students and white students in New Mexico on average? The third research question was, are there relationships between grade 9 students' non-cognitive skills on school environments and successful transitions to high schools, to high school, controlling for student background characteristics and achievement? And finally, um, are there relationships between grade 9 outcomes and students' race ethnicity? Um, are these moderated by students' perceptions of their non-cognitive skills on school environments? To answer these research questions, um, this study used descriptive analyses um, as well as structural equation modeling. So the descriptive analyses uh, consisted of analyses designed to assess the quality of the survey scales that were included on the survey, and analyses that, were co that compared the average survey scale scores of American Indian, Hispanic, and white students. The structural equation modeling was used to examine the direct effects of race, race and ethnicity and scale scores on students' grade 9 outcomes, as well as to investigate whether or not there are any indirect effects of race and ethnicity on grade 9 outcomes. 
The sample for this study um, consisted of 14 high schools from 10 school districts in New Mexico. Uh, schools were recruited based on the racial ethnic composition of the schools in the districts, as well as their location in New Mexico. So in particular, we sought to um, include districts from across the state of New Mexico, and we particularly targeted schools with high percentages of American Indian students in order to obtain a large enough sample of students in order to conduct the comparison analyses. We also sought to recruit schools with a mixture of students from all three racial ethnic backgrounds. Um, due to this, the sample isn't representative of the state of New Mexico, but it does allow for a reliable analysis of the data in order to answer our specific research questions. Um, the administrative data from this study came from the individual school districts that participated in the study, as well as the data that was collected via the study survey. Um, two different student samples were used for the analyses um, since two school districts participated in the survey, but they opted not to supply us with outcome data. So they were included in the analyses um, that were run on this, uh, the survey data that compared um, students' responses on the survey scales. They were not included in the structural equation models. Um, the difference between the two samples isn't very large overall. Um, in general, as you can see, about half of the sample was comprised of Hispanic students, with one quarter being American Indian and the other quarter being white students. Uh, the majority of the students were eligible for federal school lunch program. About 11% were English learners, and about 12% were participating in special education. Um, to collect data on students' perceptions of their non-cognitive skills and school environments, uh, survey administration occurred in November through January of 2015. REL staff, um, REL South West staff, administered the survey to grade 9 students in person um, during students' grade 9 English classes, advisory classes, or other class periods selected by the individual schools. Uh, paper and online versions of the survey were available depending on school district preference. Um, and English and Spanish versions of the um, survey were used depending on students' English or Spanish ability. Um, students completed the survey overall in about 25 minutes, and overall, 2,995 surveys were completed um, with a response rate of about 93%. Um, to tell you a little bit more about the survey that was used, um, we created the survey with significant input from the Alliance members as part of a separate RAL Southwest project. Um, the survey was entitled The Beginning High School Survey. And it consisted of seven different sections, with each section uh, containing a series of survey scales and individual items measuring students' perceptions of their non-cognitive skills and school environment. The first section on the survey was the Your School section, and it contained mostly school climate items that focused it on students' sense of belonging in the school, their feelings of safety in their school, uh, feelings of inclusion or equality in their school, as well as their perceptions of school discipline. The Your Schoolwork section um, contained items focusing on their grade 9 schoolwork and homework. Um, these included their participation in class, um, how much time, or, and how, as well as how they were studying, um, sort of the organization of their schoolwork, uh, or how well they were able to organize their schoolwork, uh, time spent on homework, their feelings of their self-efficacy with regard to their schoolwork, uh, grit, which is related to their sense of self-efficacy in terms of how um, confident they felt that they could actually they could succeed in school, as well as sort of a growth mindset, which is um, whether or not they thought that they would be able to complete schoolwork, um, whether or not um, they're they, de, de, regardless of how smart that they felt that they were. Um, the next section was the Your Grade 9 school year, which contained items that focused on planning their Grade 9 transition as well as planning for high school. Um, there was a Grade 9 a specific section focusing on Grade 9 transition, um, a question regarding how they selected their Grade 9 courses, as well as how they were planning for graduation. There's another section on the survey that focuses specifically on student teachers, and the questions in this focused on how much support they feel like they received from their teachers, as well as how well they felt that their school and their teachers were preparing them for the future. The next section focused specifically on the perceptions of their school peers, which uh, had two sc survey scales, one focusing on peer academic press, which was how much they felt that their peers were focused on academics and schools, as well as peer support, uh, which, were, which was with regard to their, how much support they felt that they were receiving from their peers with regard to their schoolwork. 
Um, they also, there was also one section on the survey that focused on parents, which focused on parent support, and the parent support focused specifically on how much support they received from their parents regarding completing schoolwork, uh, complete, going farther into school, uh, and succeeding academically. The final section on the survey focused on your future, and this section focused specifically on their future orientation as well as whether or not they felt that they were going to graduate from high school, their post-high school plans, as well as the highest level of education that they expected. Um, so schools that participated in the survey were provided with individual school reports that contained results from the students in their school. These were distributed to the schools in May and June in 2016. Um, data from the overall Basically, the data from the survey can be used to assess, to assess school climate, including information about students' parents of their students' perceptions of their teachers, peers, schools, and school discipline. Um, in particular, some potential data uses for the data from the survey. Um, schools could use data from the survey for strategic planning. Uh, it could be used to identify. Data from the survey can be used to identify scales that received low ratings from students, um, as, well to, as well as to identify scales that were correlated with the grade nine outcomes. Um, schools could implement interventions uh, to address areas that may need attention or improvement, uh, and schools can use the survey to assess students' post-high school plans. Um, like I said before, unfortunately, the results from, I can't show the results from the study, because um, the report has not finished going through review. Uh, however, the entire report, including a copy of the survey, should be available by the end of the month. Um, fingers crossed on that. So please be on the lookout from that. And then you can actually see how see the differences between students in responses, as well as how the um, survey scales were related to the specific outcomes. Uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. And it's all yours, Carmen. Thank you, Ginger. Uh, so I want to thank everyone. Thank you to our presenters and discussants uh, for sharing your insights. We want to thank everyone for attending and participating on this webinar. We hope that the information that we shared today is helpful. As I said earlier, we want to hear from you. So please make sure to take a few minutes to complete the stakeholder feedback survey. And you can do so by clicking on the link that you see on the screen. Um, we will also be sending out reminders, email reminders, with a link to the survey so that you can complete it later. Um, here's my contact information in the Southwest contact, uh, website in case you want to um, go through our web pages. Feel free to email me if you have any questions or additional comments. Uh, you can see my email address uh, there at the top. And thank you very much for your interest. Have a great afternoon. With this, we conclude today's webinar. This conference is no longer being recorded.